Welcome back to the uh, Mindset Entrepreneur video podcast. We're thrilled to have you join us this week. And let me tell you, you are in for a treat. We have an aspiring politician on today. Elmer Eubanks Archbold. Elmer, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Elmer, I have to tell you, this is a chance that I've always wanted to be like Mike Wallace from 60 Minutes. So I want to see if I can give you like some cutting edge questions here, because I know you have the capacity to answer them. No, all kidding aside, Elmer, I I really would like to start, you know, this show is about entrepreneurship. And one of the things we associate with entrepreneurship is risk, um, rejection, and a lot of characteristics that certainly tie into politics. So my first question is, what in your right mind are you thinking trying to get into politics? I know, right? It seems really crazy, especially, you know, given my background of community service and working in, in business and having started businesses too. So it's, it's, um, it's really going back to, to thinking about what are the things that, that drove me here into getting into politics. And it was like, I was looking back and I was like, like, you know, my dad was a minister. I tried to get involved in seeing what he was doing, always helping people. I, I worked in community service. I worked at Centro Las Americas. I worked in youth services. So some of the things that really, I was always trying to help people figure out what they needed to do to, to become better, to, to be successful, um, both in business and in, in, um, in the community. So that's kind of what, one of the things that kind of kept me going like, well, I, I can do better. I could do something that could really match and make a difference in the community beyond what I'm doing right now. Well, and I know, Elmer, just as an aside, I know, you know you've done work in youth services, but I also know you're really passionate about being a professor at Mount Wachusett Community College. And um, you and I have talked about how much you like helping kids and having the opportunity to further a kid's careers and confidence. So just talk about that a moment. Yeah, I think that, and that's one of the driving factors too. Uh, as a professor, I get to see the, the kids that come in and the students that come in looking to figure out, some of them don't even want to be there and some of them really want to be there. So you have this kind of mix of, of, of bag. And to really see how do, I, how do I inspire them to go beyond where they're at? And I teach economics, which is one of the toughest courses to teach, right? Yeah, wow. Um, it was one of the worst ones I took in college. It was very boring. So really trying to figure out, like, how do I inspire them to really say, hey, this, this is interesting. How, you know, and really ask them the questions and try to under, pull that out of them. Really say, hey, you can, you can understand economics. You can see what's going on in the economy as well. And, and it's not that complicated. You just kind of see you know, try to bring that out of them, and really help them understand a little bit better what, and, and they come back to me, I was like, oh, I was reading, I was watching, G, you know, the, the, I was watching the news the other day and they're talking about GDP and like, wow, you remember what that was all about, right? And so, yeah, so that was kind of very passionate about that. I didn't want to be a professor. My parents were as well. So I did, it wasn't something I wanted wow. to be, wow. so, but I found a passion for it. So. Well, let me, you, you used an interesting word there, Elmer, inspire. And I think we're all at a place right now, or a majority of us are at a place right now, where we're not really inspired by politics. We're not really inspired that politicians can make a difference. And, you know, I find in talking with a lot of politicians, they always want to tell you what they're going to do. But what was different about you when I first spoke with you is your, your backstory of why you, you got into politics and why you want to help create change. So if you could just share that a little bit. Yeah, I'd say a couple of things. One, I, I tried to, I bought up a, a property in, in Fitchburg and I thought, great, I'll, I'll be able to fix it and, and move in and, and do what I need to do and, and I'll have a, a, a nice place to live, right? Uh, no, it wasn't that easy. I, I had, to, they wouldn't turn the water on. They w- I went to get a permit. They wouldn't give me a permit. I had to go through the uh, Board of Appeals. It was like, a whole long process. It took me almost a year before I could actually get the water turned on and get the, the property to be able to fix it. And I started to ask questions, well, why, what is going on? And I found out that a lot of people in the community were having the same issues. We're dealing with like the, the, all the bureaucracies that are there and making it impossible for people. And, you, and you're like, why, are, why do we have all these boarded up houses in our community? And no one's doing anything about it. Well, they're trying to, just that they, they don't have the right tools to do that. And I think that's, that started to get me involved and say, okay, I, we need to fix this. If it's taken me a whole year to do this, and I'm just a, you know, a one person over here trying to do something, and you have people that are, that are actually builders and stuff going through the same issues, and people that are buying their homes, trying to think, oh, this is a, a good enough neighborhood that's cheap enough, I can fix the house, and I can come you know, live in here, and it's not the same. And I talked to a few people that 
were in the neighborhood before when, when it was a, you know, a French neighborhood or a Finn neighborhood in different areas of, 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 of Fitchburg. And they said, hey, when we came here, we all got together, we built our house. I built my house for my kids next door. And they didn't have all those issues. So why has the bureaucracy gotten so big that doesn't allow us to do anything anymore? It's so complicated. So we really want to figure out how do we, we unclutter that to make it possible so that we don't have those boarded up houses. So this is Elmer Eubanks Archibald, Archibald running for a state rep in the 3rd Worcester District, correct? Correct. So um, it seems like, Elmer, based on what you just said, that you really see yourself as an advocate, someone who can really stand up for people. And, and, and you know, have you had the experience to be an advocate at other points of your life that you're going to apply that experience to uh, being, being the state rep? Yes, uh, and I go back to working at Centro. Uh, one of the issues that we had was that the unemployment rate in the Latino community was really, really bad. It was, I think, if I remember correctly, it was probably like 14 or 15 percent unemployment rate. So I was like, well, how do we get people out of welfare, out of you know, you know, services from the government, and helping them achieve what they need to do? So we started looking at that, and I did okay. We'll do a fe at our festival that we had. I started putting up boots and getting companies to come and recruit people. And then I said, well, you can't recruit them if they don't have the skills, right? They don't, they'll be like, well, you know, these people don't speak the language, they don't this. So then I started doing, okay, we'll do English, English language classes so that they could, and, and it was targeted to the business English so that they understood like instructions of how to, you know, move a box from here to there. So very basic, so that it could give them an opportunity to get a job. And we started with TJ Maxx, uh, Home Depot, uh, Forget the name of the other one. It's um, the uh, that brings our boxes. Forget oh, UPS. That. UPS. UPS, so UPS yeah. was a huge one, and gave gave these guys a, an opportunity to go to work and not have to have all the skills that they needed. They could drive. They could do you know move boxes. So we started there, and we started to look at a lot of people who was trying to get jobs. So we moved that, moved the needle, and I think that really brought me to to think like we can do, we can change things, not just be like, hey, you know, we don't want people on welfare. Okay, we don't want them on welfare, but how are we helping them to get out of welfare, right? So those are that, those are some of the issues that I, I was passionate about. And Elmer, you have a really significant disadvantage that most politicians don't have, which is fundraising. And so, if you could share with our audience about that, because the fact that you have accomplished so much already without the typical uh, help. So what? What? Why is that all? Why so, is that happening? So what's happening is that I. Technically, because I work for the state as, an, as a professor at the Mount, I'm not allowed to ask anybody for money. So I have to have, rely on other people to do that for me. And so that's been a very big challenge because it's a lot different from, you know, people like to, to be asked. People like to be like, hey, true. I, want, I want to help you, but I'm not going to help you unless you, you ask me. Yep. And so you have an ask from somebody else that's not the, the person running. It's, it's like, well, why isn't he asking me for money? So that's that's the biggest challenge. So what do you do? Because that's a legitimate disadvantage. So what do you do to try to get around that? So I have a, a small committee of people that are helping me out, and I try to ask them to ask more people. And it's a little, it's uh, takes a lot longer to, to because you probably have to ask, they have to ask more times, like and explain like why isn't Elmer asking me for money, and they have to explain that. And so it's taking a little bit longer, but I think really doing kind of like guerrilla marketing and trying to figure out how do I get to let people know what I'm doing that's not going to cost me a lot of money. I try to get people to help me do things and asking people to help me in other ways that I can ask them to help me. I don't have to ask them for money. So if I can get, get them to say, hey, I can help you. What, how can I volunteer? What can I do? And really trying to answer that question really makes it a little bit easier. Well, I, I, I completely agree. And I mean, I think you're, you're taking grassroots politics to a new level. And I think when you're, you know, I, I just want to show uh, our audience uh, so Elmer's knocking on doors, and this is what you might ha uh, see if, you, if he comes to your house. And I think that, I want to talk a little bit about that, Elmer, because I think when you, you go to someone's house, uh, the perception, first of all, you're battling so many perceptions. First of all, someone who knocks on your door, most people, I don't care who you are, most people are, don't even want to let you in, they don't want to open the door, they're like, it's a salesperson, so on and so forth. So let's assume you get by that perception. Then once they learn who you are and they see you're a politician, then God knows what kind of feelings they have about politics. So on the flip side, that paints a negative picture. On the flip side, 
it speaks to a lot of your character that you prioritize doing that and that you're trying to get to know people and learn and listen and things like that. So how has that experience been for you so far? And do you ever go home at night feeling depressed or sad because people won't open the door? Well, that's that's a challenge, right? Trying to get them to. So sometimes I wonder if they actually it seems like their cars in the garage, but they won't open the door. So I have to leave them. That's kind of those tags. Leave them at, at the door and hope that yep. they would read it and maybe get a sense of like who I am. Um, but when they do open the door, I, I often get the, the question like, well, so who are you? Because they've never heard of me before. It's like, you know, you're, you're a politician. And then they'll be like, and what party are you from? You know, what party are you? And then sometimes I get the, the response like, oh, you're a Republican. Uh, and I had this one lady just basically take my pamphlet and was like, thank you very much. <laughs> and started to close the door. And I'm like, but really? Like, you're not going to listen to what I have to say and find out like, so then she she started. Well, you know what? I yeah, I shouldn't be that way, right? I should uh, I should at least listen to you. I'm just tired of all the the crazy stuff that's going on. It's just driving me insane. So I don't want to deal with politics. And I was like, well, I'm not a, a real politician. I'm I'm a community person that's trying to make a difference in the community. And we started a conversation. And before you know it, she asked asked us into her house wow. and introduced me to her husband. And we had a really good conversation about. How, how do we affect change locally? And I was like, it's really about what's important to you. What are the issues that you're fighting? Uh, is it, you know, so a lot of people are like, the roads are, are bad and how do we bring that money back to, the, to our town to fix the roads so that our cars aren't like, you know, damaged all the time? Uh, our educational system, how are you gonna change that? And being an educator, I can at least inform, have some perspective of what it is to be a teacher and do that. So. Three, you know, three things that I that I talk about with them, and, they, and then they're like, "Well, you know what? I'll I'll consider you because I really wasn't going to until, you know, especially they, they get that screen of like, your what party?" <laughs> so, well, actually, I mean, you made a good point. I didn't even think about it. there's that that third level. So you're not the same political party. You'd have to get past that level too, which is a good point. Have you encountered um, an indifference to voting? Like, forget about whether they're going to vote for you. They're going to vote at all. Have you seen any of that? I've seen some of that, too. Yeah. Some people are like, well, you know, I'm, I'm done with politics. I'm not, I'm not getting involved, and I'm done. I'm not going to vote. And that's the apathy that we have to kind of, kind of get beyond, try to get people to really see that. And I come from a country that, you know, we vote 90, I think it's like 92% of the population votes. Wow. So to come here, I was an election commissioner, and I was looking wow. at the vote in Worcester, and I'm like, I, this is not incredible that people aren't aren't participating and they just feel this apathy like it doesn't matter what i'm going to do it doesn't matter my vote doesn't count you know here and especially here in massachusetts i think we have that feeling because it's all one-sided politics mm. all democrat so people are like oh, i'm not not going to be involved they're still you know and that's the same thing that happened right with this elections it's people feel like well you know I'm, my vote doesn't count so i'm not going to show up so really trying to get that people to change that that attitude and i did it in, in Worcester, uh, we, we had a, I organized people to, to get registered to vote. Uh, one of the things that people don't know, I've, I'm as a Republican, I actually figured out the rules of the Democratic uh, Party. And we went to the convention. I, t I brought 22 delegates that were alternates because the Latino population has never been uh, given the opportunity to get involved in politics. Like, we want you to vote Democrat, but we don't want you to get involved in, in running party. And so that had been the, the issue when I was running Central in, in the 90s. And so I organized people. We got 22 people. I got them to the convention. They were alternate, alternates at the convention. So I used their same rules. And I wasn't, it doesn't matter. It wasn't about Republican or Democrat. It was about trying to get people involved in the political process. If, if you're blue, red, green, doesn't matter. Get involved. Do something. If you, you're passionate about something, really get involved and do that. So, Elmer, with that said, you know, when you look at your opponent, is you, the differences is the, are the primary differences between you and your opponent kind of what you said where you're just focused on the global aspect of getting people energized and inspired and involved in politics or are there specific issues that you could point to that say well no my opponent feels this and i feel this no i think there there might be some similarities with my, myself and my opponent i think there are some very stark differences uh, especially when it comes to the constitution um they voted for against our gun rights and i'm very passionate about having i don't i don't have any guns but i have i like to be able to have that opportunity that if i needed them i could have and we're we've been stripping away those rights recently as well 
But the, the biggest issue is really being responsive to the community and really having somebody that's going to be, you know, you call me, you respond to me, you text me, I'm going to respond and say, I'm going to try to find a solution to the issue. Even if I don't know the answer, I'll try to find it. And I do the same thing with my students in class. I mean, they, they text me or email me at 12 in the morning or, or 1 at, at, in the morning and I respond to them and they're surprised. Like, you responded? And I think that's the same thing that I want to bring to the state house. somebody that's going to be responsive. And I don't see that in our, in our political process. A lot of people just like, well, you feel like your politician is this big person up there that you can't even reach. Well, Omar, do you worry about the fact that, you know, you talk about an issue like uh, gun, you know, gun rights, which is a pretty, it's not a simple issue. There's a lot of nuances. However, here you are in Massachusetts, a pretty liberal state. So you, you chose to bring this up. Did, does it worry you that you would be uh, vocal about an issue that it, you'd be in the minority in this state? Not really. I, I was surprised that a, there are a lot of Democrats in our district that are pro-Constitution, that are pro-guns. Um, it's not, it's, and, it, and we've gotten into this fight about what's, you know, the, the, the material stuff. The guns are the ones that are killing people. Well, I don't know. It's really people. And how do we focus on helping people with their mental health issues? How do we focus on helping them with, with getting access to services so that they're not, you know, losing their minds and going out? Because they can kill you with whatever. They, you know, I can, make, I can figure out how to make a bomb. And I, I lived in Nicaragua during the war, uh, during the revolution. And, you know, kids would make grenades and stuff out of, out of nothing. And they'll throw, you know, they'll throw them at the, at the military police. Uh, so it's, it's a crazy, you know, it's, it's easy to do. And right now there's a big issue about being able to print print guns, and, and that's another big issue that's going to start to, to brew up. So. Omar, I know you have quite a bit of experience. You've had several governmental positions in the past. I know that um, you've completed affordable housing projects. Talk a little bit some of the challenges you faced and how you were to see those projects through to completion. So one of the projects that I did in Boston was an affordable housing project. And I, came, uh, I became director of a nonprofit there called Boston Asian Concerns. And they had a, a large project that they had on the books that they were trying to do. And it uses, and simplifying it, they use tax credits and use grant money to build, we were building 40 units. They're, they were behind the, 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 the ball on the schedule. And just to give you a quick example, one of the things that, that we had to meet in order to get our funding for the project was that we had to get the authorization from the state. Um, they were about to lose it. So I, you know, had in connections, I knew a lot of the, the governor and the lieutenant governor at the time was, the governor was Jane Swift. And I was able to go to D8, O8, uh, DHCD, I think, the Department of Housing, and they've changed all the acronyms now, but be able to go to them and talk to them and say, hey, we, you know, we have this project, it's been authorized, but we're about to lose it. We need to extend a little bit of time so we can get, I can get this under, you know, fix this issue. So I got their help. I'm, and that's one of the things that I'm good at. I'm really at figuring out how to solve things. And just to give you a quick example, I had, a, um, I had to meet the, the, a deadline of, of occupancy for the building. And we didn't have our elevator ready. Uh, we have to have the elevator fully functional. And one of the things that we had to have is have a phone line when they come and do the inspection that the phone would be able to pick up and ring on the elevator. And we didn't have the, the phone company hadn't installed the line. So I ran a phone line from one of our buildings that was four blocks away, ran it into the building for the inspection, and when they came to inspect, they were able to make a call. Uh, so that's how creative I am. I'm trying to figure out like, okay, we need to get this done. And if I would have lost like $4 million there for not having that on time. Wow. So, well, so creative and resourceful. Re very resourceful. Right? So. so Elmer, you know, if we, had, if we had a group of constituents, people in your district, in Lunenburg and Fitchburg, when I ask you what is their biggest concern, my opinion, and I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this, my opinion is not so much that politicians can't deliver, no, not so much that politicians, they don't like the ideas and the approach and the strategy of politicians, but their skepticism and able to trust that they will actually follow through and do what they say. So for people out there who are watching this and getting to know you, and they're questioning if they can trust you, not because of anything you've done, but just because they don't trust. Why can people trust you? What is it about you that's trustworthy as opposed to others? So I think that the difference is that I'm, I'm willing to listen and I'm willing to respond. And if I don't know, I don't know the answer, I'm willing to tell you that I don't know the answer and I'll find, like so that. I'll find that. 
And I think that's really where I'm, I'm different. I'm not going to be telling you, hey, I'm going to do this, this, and this. No, I'm going to listen to you and I'm going to try to find the solution that you need. And that's what I'm going to be able to do. I'm not promising the world, but I'm promising that I'm going to be there fighting to fix the issues that we have. Well, and I also think, Elmer, I know people who know you, and I think they would say, you're also willing to adapt. You know, if something's not working, you're willing to adapt your approach until you find the right solution, which I think is a huge, hugely positive characteristic of a politician. Thank you. Yeah, I yeah. appreciate that. Uh, so last question, Elmer, you know, what about someone outside your district? I mean, obviously you're looking for support within your district, but why would someone outside your district support your campaign? So I think that's that's the one of the issues that I've, I've I've been asked before is like, well, you know, I've known you for a long time, but why should I? You're running in Fitchburg. Why should I bother? Yeah. Um, but it, the state is is we cover. I mean, as a politician, we're representing our district, but at the same time, we're representing the whole state because when we make decisions, we're not making decisions in a vacuum, just representing one one area. We're representing everybody. And so I I've experienced that I when I was working at Centro and other organizations is that out call. I'd call on everybody that I knew at the state house if I wanted to get a bill passed, if I want to get you know, funding through. I want to, you want to get everybody on board. So you want to be able to collaborate and work with everybody to do that. So it's not just limited to just one, one area. And I think that's what sometimes people miss is that we are electing a politi- you know, somebody to the state house, but it's beyond just our district. The whole state needs people that are going to be mindset of how do I help our whole state as well as, as, well as our community. Elmer, I'd like to finish our broadcast today by you looking at the camera and letting our audience know what would this mean to you? Having the opportunity to serve people, um, being able to accomplish being a state representative personally, what would this mean to you? So that's a, that's a, lot, that's a tough question, right? So what would it mean to me? I think what it would mean to me is that I would be able to help my community and make it better. I think that's really what I want to do. I want to be able to go there. Uh, to the state house, look at the issues that we're dealing with, the opioid ep- epidemic, the educational system, our roads, try to fix that and really come back and say, you know, I'm able to listen to what your issues are and bring those to the state house and make a difference in our lives. Elmer Eubanks Archbold, thank you so much for joining us today. Really appreciate having you. Third, di- third Worcester District candidate for state representative. Get out and vote. Thank you very much for joining us for another edition of the Mindset Entrepreneur video podcast. We will see you next time.